The following message is made available for you by Emmanuel Baptist Church in Mora, Minnesota. For more information, visit us online at www.emmanuelmora.com. Have you ever had to fight for something? I don't mean physically fight, though maybe you've had a time where you've needed to do that, to, to fight for your safety and protection. But what I mean is, have you ever had a time in your life in which you've had to stand up for something or work really hard in order for some good to come? Maybe you fought for your kids. Maybe you've been an advocate for them. Uh, maybe you have had a medical crisis and you've had to fight for your life. Uh, it seems like we're always fighting or we're always striving for something. And, you know, companies are the same way. Uh, Right now, Target is fighting for your business. They are actively working hard to have you go to their store rather than Walmart. They are actively working hard so that you would go to their website and not Amazon. Um, You think about uh, Chili's. I mean, I wish we had a Chili's around here rather than an Applebee's, to tell you the truth. I love me some Chili's. And Chili's is trying to actively get you to go to Chili's rather than Uh, And stay away from Applebee's and come where you can get some baby back ribs. Uh, Business startups are fighting for survival. They need investors and they need customers. And almost every nonprofit organization out there is fighting for something. I went to the the World Wildlife uh, Foundation, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, this week. And on the beginning of their website, right after their name, it says, Protect the Future of Nature. Well, there you go. They're telling you right there what they're fighting for. Uh, Went to Compassion International this week, and their logo has right under it, releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. What are they fighting? They're fighting poverty, uh, especially for, for kids. So you get the point. Everyone everywhere is fighting for something. There's some cause. There's something that we are passionate uh, about. Some of them are good. Some of them maybe not so good. For Christians, it's no different. However, what Christians are fighting for and called to fight for is vastly more important than anything else in this world. Uh, We are to fight for the gospel, which is the good news of what Jesus has done in his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension on our behalf as a, a substitute And it's vastly more important because it's only the gospel that has the power to save people from the power of sin and eternal punishment. It is only the gospel that truly restores us to be the people that we were created to be. It is only in the gospel by which we find hope and healing in life. And it is only in the gospel that we can be uh, repaired from not only our guilt but also the shame that we might feel from maybe being victimized or traumatized or violated. It is this gospel that we must fight for because it is God's plan to redeem the world. So in the past few weeks, we've gone through the first chapter of Paul's first letter to Timothy, and there was a common theme. There are false teachers that are in the church that are uh, spreading teachings that are deadly, dangerous, and wrong. And so now Timothy has been sent there to fight the good fight. And one of the ways that we saw last week that that Timothy and us are to fight the good faith is by holding a good conscience as well as faith. And in today's passage, he's going to tell Timothy and us uh, what the first action steps we should take in fighting for the faith. And so the things that we're going to need to take away from today is that we need to actively uh, fight for the gospel through prayer, and we need to fight for the gospel through proclamation. So we'll take those two. We'll have a little sandwich piece of a diversion uh, in the middle there, but those are primarily what we're looking at. The first thing that we're going to see today is that we need to fight for the gospel through prayer. We need to fight for the gospel through prayer. Verse 1 begins this whole new section of the letter uh, by helping Timothy to get his mind around not just how to fight the fight of faith uh, or to counter these false teachers, but also how to reorder the church so that it is not in chaos anymore. And the very first thing he tells Timothy to do is to pray. Verse 1, 
As I urged you, uh, I'm sorry, first of all, then, I urge that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone. So he starts off with this term, first of all. Uh, He's not giving Timothy necessarily a sequential to-do list that once you've mastered this, you move on to that. But rather, he is displaying a priority here. If Timothy wants any kind of success in any shape or form as the interim here at Ephesus to, to clean the house, this here is the high priority, and it's prayer. It is not a mere suggestion. The word urge is very strong here that Paul uses. It's like Paul saying, Timothy, I beg you, pray. An old term would have been, I beseech you, You need to do this. But with the way that Paul's argument flows here, we have to quantify what Paul means when he says that prayers be made for everyone. It's hard to imagine that that Paul is uh, encouraging Timothy to pray for every single individual in the entire known world. Uh, It it seems, uh, and it doesn't seem that he's asking Timothy to pray for everyone in the church at Ephesus because that's already assumed. That's what a pastor does. It was a precedent that was set by Samuel so many years ago in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, when Samuel said to the people after their disobedience of picking a king, he said, as for me, I'm getting out of the spotlight, but I vow that I will not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And so what the context seems to point to then is that Paul is urging Timothy to pray for all sorts of people. When we recall the fact that back in chapter 1, verse 4, these false teachers were obsessed with what he called endless genealogies. It points to the fact that these these false teachers here uh, perverted the gospel so much to an extent that they held that only certain kinds of people were in and all other people were out. It was all about genealogies. But Paul says, no, 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 no. When it comes to the gospel, God desires that all sorts of people be saved. Therefore, we need to be praying for all kinds of people. And we need to take heed of this mandate because though many of us would intellectually ascend to that idea of praying for all kinds of people and the idea that everyone needs Jesus, what can often happen is that our focus can narrow to the sense that we only pray for those who look like us, who talk like us, who dress like us, maybe would be in the same socioeconomic circle, And we tend to forget those other types of people. We are like the false teachers and the people in the church of Ephesus here where we're easily wooed into a homogenous idea of evangelism. And so when Paul says here, first of all, I urge that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone, he means that our prayers ought to be directed to God on behalf of of all sorts of kinds of people, even the kinds of people that we don't like. That's why Paul here uh, provides an example of the kinds of people that the church of Ephesus and Timothy specifically should be praying for. In verse 2 he says, for kings and all those who are in authority. Now this is quite genius, I think, on, on the part of Paul here because Uh, those who are in leadership positions, especially those who are elected officials, are generally low-hanging fruit when it comes to public dislike. They are very easy to point the finger at. And so Paul is making the argument, therefore, that while the, the people of Ephesus may not particularly like the emperor or his policies, or the way that he views Christians, 
or any other member of the Senate or the governors of that age. God loves them. And God's desire for them is what Paul says in verse 4, where he says that God wants everyone, meaning all kinds of people, to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And you have a part to play for their potential salvation through prayer. However, I have a fear that some in the evangelical church have contributed to this intense polarization of our culture by associating the church of the Lord Jesus Christ with that of a particular political viewpoint. One quick scroll on Facebook shows the immense disdain and dare I say even hatred that some Christians have for anyone that has a different view of what they think politically. How many of you have prayed for President Biden, Vice President Harris, Governor Walls. If you haven't, you have a job to do. If you have, then ask yourself this question. Does the way that I speak about that individual online, in conversations, or even in my own heart, match up with the things that I should be or am praying for them. When you crack jokes about the president or when you harbor bitterness in your heart against Governor Walls, what does that say to the world about your desire for them to be saved and to come to know Jesus? When you post that meme or the gif on Facebook or even in private messages, does your heart Line up with God's desire that all should be saved. Verse 1 claims that it's part of praying for them. Have you ever thanked God for them? You don't have to like their policies, but you are called to pray for their salvation and have a heart that backs up that desire. This is good, Paul tells us in verse 3. And it pleases God our Savior. Paul wrote this elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, when he says that our goal in life and death is to be pleasing to our God. So why, why does it please him? Verse 4 tells us. It pleases God our Savior because he wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So it all comes back to this idea of fighting for truth. God wants all kinds of people to be saved. It's not an exclusive party. He wants everyone to know him. As, and these false teachers have perverted that. There were people that were all over the city of Ephesus that were not hearing the true word of Jesus. One, because of false teachers. Two, because people had ceased to pray for them. And if we were to get in a helicopter right now and we could see all of Connecticut County, we would find all kinds of people driving around and walking around, and we would see that there are all kinds of people. There are nice homes. There are trailer parks. There are elected officials. There's blue-collar and white-collar workers. There's younger people. There's older people. And Jesus loves them all. How are you fighting for the truth by praying that the gospel would pierce their hearts? Pray earnestly that their ears would be recept that their ears would not be receptive to the lies of the culture, but that they would welcome the truth of Christ with repentance and faith. Friends, we need to fight for the gospel through prayer. But second, we need to embrace the victory in Christ. We need to embrace the victory in Christ. A big question in this whole discussion is why would God use prayer as one of the means by which he would act for salvation in someone's life? Verse 5, Paul attempts to make it plain. He says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, 
mankind, the man Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, there is, uh, this is all grounded in the fact that there's this huge gulf between us and God. Because people are sinful by nature and by choice, we have caused this separation, this conflict with God. And Scripture goes so far as to say that in our sins, we are enemies of God. And Eli really got to the point when he questioned his son all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 2, when he says, if one person sins against another, God can intercede for him. But if a person sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? So when there's a rift between two people and they're at an impasse, it's often helpful to bring in a third party to go between them. And most of the time, the conventional wisdom is right in saying that the third party probably should be someone that has no vested interest in the conflict at all and may not even know the two individuals. Uh, so that way, they're not swayed. Let's say, for example, there's a legal dispute between family members. Someone has just died, and the, and the will is very vague, and there's all this stuff to go through, and the family is, is butting heads over who gets what and, and how they are to do that. Or I know of churches that have been in very serious conflict that they have brought in a mediator to weed out the, the various issues within a church in order to come to a resolution and restore unity and peace within a church. And a good mediator has skills to sort out all the details, what matters, what doesn't, get to the actual root of what the problem is, facilitate good communication, and come to a resolution. It might take a few sessions, but it is possible if the person is skilled and the parties involved are willing and, and desiring to make something happen other than get their way pushed forward. And one key, again, to have a successful mediation is that the mediator isn't initially aware of the situation. He doesn't have any bias. He's not in the pocket of one or another. But when it comes to Jesus, however, he is uniquely suited to be our mediator with God. On the one hand, he is fully divine. He is, in his very essence, true God of true God, one in being with the Father. He has a vested interest in the glory of God, in God's holiness, in his honor, because he himself is God. On the other hand, Jesus is fully human. <laughs> he shares the very nature of what it means to be human without having a sinful nature. He has a vested interest in humanity being restored to God. So when Paul writes here that there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, he is saying that from beginning to end, Christ is all. He is the one that we ought to desire. He is the one that brings us peace. And he goes on to quantify the means here by which Christ is qualified to be our advocate. Verse 6. Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. So in order to bridge this gap, in order to pay this, this restitution, to fill the void between us and, and God, a ransom had to be paid. Now you might know a ransom from maybe you've seen a movie where someone's been kidnapped, or maybe you watch a, you've seen a true crime documentary or Listen to a podcast where they talk about this, this ransom. And a ransom is some sort of payment demanded for the release of a, of a prisoner. In this case, all of us are prisoners to sin. And because we're trapped and we're held captive by this sin, someone needs to pay the ransom for us. And when Christ was lifted on the cross and he gave up his life, he was paying that ransom that we could not afford. But the question is, who is he paying off? Who did the ransom go to? It wasn't Satan. 
if that were the case, then by logic we'd have to say that God actually owed Satan something and that we owed Satan something. Rather, the Bible is clear that the debt that we owed, the sin debt that we owed, we owed to God the Father. And as Christ hung on that cross, bruised and bloodied, cold and dead, he paid to God what we owed, our life. Except that when he did that, he had the weight of, of every sin from every person that would come to him in faith. His work on the cross was sufficient for everyone in the entire world, but only applied and efficient for those who would come to him in faith. And this is the truth that God desires all kinds of people to embrace. It isn't some generic truth. It isn't a truth among others. There's only one way to be ransomed and saved through Jesus Christ. And before that we pray, before we pray that others could come to embrace this, we need to check ourselves and ask ourselves if we truly believe this. Maybe you're here today and you've never really trusted in this gospel. You weren't fighting for anything because you're still captive to sin. You can, you can be ransomed today by Christ's work. It's applied to you by faith. If that's you, you can go to Christ right now in prayer. Stop listening to me and just pray. Tell Jesus, I'm in. That, oh God, I want to be forgiven. And thank him for paying the price for you. But if you're here today and you've been there for a while, it's time to take the next step into faith. It's good to pray for all kinds of people. It says that it pleases God. The best thing for, that you can do for your life is to embrace that good news. But Christ doesn't call us to embrace the good news and just sit. He calls us to action. And that's our third point today, is that we need to partner with God through proclaiming the gospel. Partner with God through proclaiming the gospel. You know, the end of every election cycle brings about a flurry of political appointments. Senators and representatives need to go out and appoint staffers. The president and vice president need to appoint all sorts of people for all sorts of positions. And the interesting thing about an appointment is that none of these individuals appoint themselves. None of them says, hey, guess what? I'm going to be the Secretary of State and I'm going to make myself become that. Rather, they have to be appointed. Some just get the job and are just thrown right in. Some, it's a lot more work. Uh, some have to go through committees and the Senate and the House and, and, and all sorts of stuff in order to get appointed to their position. In verse 7, Paul talks about his appointment to not just a certain position with God's mission, but really three positions. They weren't anything he applied for. I think Scripture's pretty clear that Paul didn't seek it out. He didn't pay for it. It was rather given to him by God. It says, For this I was appointed as a herald, an apostle, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So there's this, this triad of roles here that Paul was given, a herald, apostle, and teacher. A herald is one of those uh, people that you would see some of those newspaper boys back in the day or in a movie where they would put up some soap boxes or milk crates and they would, they would get out, hear ye, hear ye, this happened today in the news. Uh, I was in Fiddler on the Roof one time uh, as a musical, and my role was the guy who was the newspaper stand guy, and I would always come out with this newspaper saying, there's terrible news from the outside world. Uh, that's what a herald is. They're meant to shout things from the roof, rooftops of what's going on. Not only that, but Paul was appointed to be an apostle. Now, this is an apostle with, with a capital A, it was a designation only given to a few people. People that were specifically commissioned to buy Jesus Christ 
himself to begin to do the work of the gospel proclamation through the world. Most apostles, with a capital A, were, uh, were disciples of Jesus and spent time, though there were some, uh, there were some that were very closely associated with, with Jesus' disciples, such as Paul. This is not a designation that exists anymore. There are some who would call themselves apostles, but their definition is different than what this is talking about. And lastly, Paul says that he was appointed a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Now that role speaks for itself, but what's interesting here is how many times just in this sentence alone he brings up truth. It's only mentioned twice, but a repetition like that in one sentence ought to speak out to us especially with the context of dealing with false teachers. If you remember in our first message, all the way back in 1 Timothy chapter 1, not only was Timothy having to deal with the doctrinal issues that were being taught, but he also had to deal with an authority issue. He was an emissary of Paul, and the people at Ephesus had abandoned seeing Paul as authoritative. And here, Paul is once again asserting his authority, by claiming his appointment as an apostle, as, an, as a herald, and as a teacher, which is divinely given to him. Look back in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and Christ Jesus our hope. It doesn't say here that he was uh, an apostle of Christ Jesus because he wanted to be. He was commanded by God. He's not making it up. He's not trying to get attention to himself. He's not trying to stroke his ego. Rather, this is serious business here. And if you are in Christ Jesus, you have been called as well. Certainly not as an apostle with a capital A, uh, nor may some of us be gifted in teaching, though some of us may be very gifted in teaching. As a Christian, you are called as a herald. You are an ambassador of Christ, and therefore your life, your words, your behavior, and thought patterns is telling something to a watching world about who God is and what he is like. And so as ambassadors, we must take up the mission that our king has sent us on. We must partner with him in what he is doing. Whether you're here to stay in Kaneva County, or if you are planning to go out into the uttermost parts of the world, God's calling you to be a missionary. You are called to the battlefield. You are called to fight not with weapons of destruction, but with the gospel of peace. You know, every one of us have probably had to fight for something at some point in our life. Sometimes the fight is worth it. Sometimes we learn very quickly which hills to die on and which ones not to. But the gospel is the most important thing in the world, and it's worth fighting for. And God has given us the means by which we can engage in this battle. Prayer, the truth of Christ crucified, and boldly living out the gospel and proclaiming it. So whether you are just in boot camp and just gotten into this Lord's army, or if you've been on the battle for many years, there's always room to grow. What do you need to do today in fighting for the gospel in your own heart, in your family, in the church, and in the world. Let's pray. You have been listening to a message from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Mora, Minnesota. You are welcome to pass this message along to others, but please don't charge for it or alter it in any way without written permission from Emmanuel Baptist Church. This message has been made available by the generous supporters of Emmanuel Baptist Church. For additional information about how you can partner with Emmanuel, please visit us at www.emmanuelmora.com.
There you will find more free messages and links to ministry opportunities to help you grow in your faith. If you are watching on YouTube, please click the subscribe button to always receive the latest messages. Thanks again for listening. Emmanuel Baptist Church, Mora, Minnesota. Knowing Christ and making Him known.